Welcome this evening, uh, May 5th, 2021 Facilities Planning Committee meeting. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. The meeting is being held in the traditional unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil tooth Nations. The meeting is live streamed and the audio and visual recording will also be available to the public for viewing after the meeting. Footage of the meeting may be viewed inside and outside of Canada. Just want to quickly go over meeting decorum. The board has a strong commitment to ethical conduct. Uh, I won't go through uh, the the items with regards to meeting decorum as we have been um, very good with regards to respect for one another. Just wanted to point out the um, the importance of speaking through the chair um, so there's not uh, crosstalk between committee members without going through the chair. But during this virtual meeting, <laughs> that, that's hard to do anyways. So thank you very much for the meeting decorum. I'm going to go do a roll call. So if everyone can please uh, all unmute. And once you say you're present after I call your name, uh, you can mute again. All right. So let's start with the um, the the trustees that are on the facilities planning committee officially. Uh, Oliver Hansen. Present chair. Thank you. you. Jennifer Reddy. Trustee Reddy. Okay. Uh, Carmen Cho. Present chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, alternate is Lois Chan Pedley. Present chair. Thank you. Thank you. If Jennifer doesn't show up, then you'll be the official person. Um, I'll go through the rest of the trustees. Uh, Fraser Ballantyne. Present chair. Thank you. Janet Fraser. Here, thank you, chair. Thank you. Estrelita Gonzalez. Present chair, thank you. Thank you. Bar Parrott. Yes, I'm here, thank you. Thank you. Uh, senior managers, uh, superintendent of school, Suzanne Hoffman. I'm here. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Suzanne. Uh, Secretary Treasurer David Green. I'm here, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, rest of senior management. Carmen Batista. I'm present, Chair. Thank, thank you. Pedro De Silva. Pedro. Jody Langlois. David Nelson. Present chair. Thank you, David. Rob Schindel. And oh, in the room with me, Ron McDonald, Present the director. Chairman. Thank you. Um, reps, uh, Terry Stanway, VSTA. Yes, present chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Vesta, Allison Jambor. Present. Thank you. Vasa, Kelly Eggleson. Present chair. Thank you. Vepfa, Karen Noel Bentley. Present chair. Thank you. Thank you. IUOE, Tim Chester. Present chair. Thank you. Thank you. Passa, Ajaz Hazan. Uh, present chair. Thank you. Thank you. QP15, Chris Brown. Present chair. Thank you. Thank you. Deepak, Amanda Hillis. Present chair. Thank you. Thank you. Trades, Neil Monroe. QP407, Brent Boyd. Present Chair, thank you. Thank you. VDSC, Joe Sugarman. Present Chair, thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? John Dawson? Yes, Present Chair, thank you. Thank you, John. And James DeHoop. Present Chair, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Am I missing anybody that I did not call out? Oh, that's great. Thank you everyone for uh, committing this uh, evening with us. Um, today's agenda item um, includes two delegations and then information item, discussion item, and items for approval. Uh, delegation, I'll start off with Vic Canna, wants to discuss Vancouver Project Office MOU, then Himanshu Meta with regard to the Fleming school site. So let's start it off with Vic. Vic, are you with us? I'm with you guys. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yes, we can hear you clearly. 
Awesome. Great. We can get the uh, video going. All right. Do you want us to advance it or do you have some, do you have something on the screen here? Uh, right now I see item 1.1 delegation. If you can get my view big. Okay. Ron, do you know who's controlling the screen? Oh, here, Jennifer Reddy's here. Here we, here we go. Okay, I just, I see your, um, it's V1. Can you share something, Vic? Um, oh, I, I'm not sure. So what I'm asking for here right now is on the YouTube, is it say item 1.1 delegation as a big thing, or is it me as a big? It shows you V1. Okay. Your icon. What, yeah. Okay. In a small or in big? Like in? In small, right oh. in the middle, a circle. Okay. So you're not getting me in terms of what's on the slideshow. You can make it so that the speaker is a view instead of the slide, which just says item 1.1 delegation. Uh, it moved past that and it says V1 right now. So um, I'm not sure okay. who's controlling this, but if they can advance the next page. Maybe he could. Okay. Oh, yeah, let's roll. I don't think uh, uh, maybe it's a miscommunication, but if I'm on the big screen, then great. Uh, otherwise, we see the slideshow, which is static, right? So that's, that's the issue here. Okay, right. uh, let's start off by looking at... Uh, a bit of acknowledgement and kudos to Suzanne Hoffman. Um, I want to thank her for her service. I saw the announcement today. I know she's still with us for a bit, so that's fantastic. Uh, but I wish Suzanne the absolute best. I want to acknowledge that Suzanne has helped in many aspects of Vancouver and me personally. She's helped me to do call-ins instead of call-outs. And this issue really is one that almost gives me PTSD, uh, this one around the MOU. And that's because I got involved in advocacy because of this issue. So in January 2019, I go to the open house for my high school, uh, kids' high school. And there they have an open house and they announce, hey, we're going to build a brand new school. And it should be a time of celebration. But it wasn't we found out that the brand new school would not have space for arts, music, no auditorium, and on and on. So a lot of parents were kind of frustrated. And then we looked at it and said, why does this happen? And then I looked at it a little bit more and I found out that it's happening everywhere. Uh, so the school that is behind me is another school, and this is called Edith Cavell. So what this MOU is about, if I had to state it factually for a lot of people, it's basically a rule book. The rule book says you must pick the lowest cost option out of essentially an upgrade to the building or a partial replacement or a full replacement. And the lowest cost is very, very prescribed. So it basically says you cannot count on a life cycle. So you can't even include uh, what it's going to cost in the long run. Uh, you can't include deferred maintenance, for example. Uh, accessibility doesn't count. Sustainability doesn't count. So sustainability is a big one. Accessibility is a big one. Water quality, uh, so lead piping, lead paint, asbestos, uh, air quality, all of that does not count. So what's happening behind me is this school is going to be um, upgraded, not replaced. And here's the kicker. Here's a part that's really troubling. It's going to cost way more to do this than it would have if this school was just simply replaced with a brand new school. So an upgrade costs more when a life cycle is included. And in this case behind me, this school would have cost more just on a 10-year, on a, just a 10-year life cycle, this school here would have cost way less if it was brand new than what we're doing with it today. So upgrades cost more in the long run, even in a short run in many cases. 
But the rule book says you cannot pick that because you have to pick the lowest initial cost. So that's what the MOU is. Now, the trustees and the staff are aware of this. And I want to give some acknowledgement and kudos to the st staff and the trustees for trying, for trying to work with the ministry on including deferred maintenance and life cycle costs into the lowest cost definition. You tried, and that's evident in some of the uh, uh, paperwork uh, that will be displayed later on, and the evidence shows that you wrote letters, you got a letter back, you even have a draft of what the wording should look like, which is great, but it didn't happen. The ministry said the ministry will consider deferred maintenance. Well, consider doesn't change the rule book. So the rule book stays the same in the MOU. And that is a fundamental problem. So what that means is the rule book prescribes how the people on the steering committee make their decisions. You cannot make a different decision than what the rule book prescribes. So that's the problems with the MOU in a nutshell. The solutions at this stage, at the 11th hour, are really, really difficult. So the ask that I have of this committee and the trustees in this committee is to really discuss what alternatives are possible, what can be done, because this rule book is not good. It's going to result in decisions that will end up costing a lot more in the long run. And if things cost a lot more in the long run, then our kids get disserviced and the taxpayers get insulted. So there has to be something here where the trustees can look at this and say, what are our options? What can we do? If I have any suggestions on that, the low bar, the super low bar is we can't tell the ministry we don't want an MOU. We don't want a Vancouver project office because we do have to advance our seismic projects and we have to make them even go faster. So we want all our schools to be safe. So abandoning the MOU and abandoning the Vancouver Project Office is not a possibility. So a low bar solution would be to extend it for one year instead of three while we work on some really important things. And the really important things are what the trustees have prescribed in their long range plan, which is a trustee vision for our facilities. That vision is really good, trustees. Work on that. The city is working on a Vancouver plan. That's also going to make the concept of complete communities and the definition of what a neighborhood school means really defined and important. And then there is work going on with the trustees uh, at the BC trustee association level where they're trying to work on um, better life cycle rules for capital funding. So that work is also going to happen. So that would be the low bar solution is, you know what? Just extend it for one year instead of three. And while we work on all these things and have a more of a understanding with the ministry and the understanding with the ministry is kind of important. Our relationship with the ministry is probably described as broken. And a lot of that has to do with the CSF. The ministry badly wants us to sell land and sell school sites. Part of it is to find the CSF, a school site west of Main Street. And until, I guess, Vancouver does that, they're going to not be nice to Vancouver. So this is very complicated, trustees. This is very complicated. My ask of you today is to deliberate this. Do not treat this lightly, because three more years of MOUs that result in the lowest cost decision will cause further, further disruption and way more increased costs, way more injustice to our kids. And at the end of the day, a giant insult. I'm a taxpayer, you're a taxpayer. We're all British Columbians. Why should a 100-year-old school be upgraded at a greater cost than when it could be replaced? But that's what the rule book prescribes. So this is all about the rule book. It's not about the people. It is about changing the rules so we get better rules in place. Thank you for your consideration, trustees. Thank you. Thanks, Vic, for taking the time. Um, Vic, you're speaking for yourself rather than Deepak, right? 
Yeah, of course. Uh, um, so uh, I am um, passionate clear. about this one, and um, uh, I asked to be a personal delegation, partly because of timing. I would have loved to have taken this to DPAC and had uh, DPAC deliberate on it. I'm also the chair of the DPAC Facilities Committee, and I did run this in our DPAC Facilities Committee Slack. I got concurrence on um, the problems. Uh, I did not really, you know, really engage sure. into what the solutions are. Uh, so this solution of a low bar solution is uh, my own creation. Uh, so thank you for clarifying that, Alan. This is not the views of DPAC. This is the views of a personal parent that really faces some PTSD around this. Thank, thank you. Understood. All right. I'll open it up um, to um, committee members. Any questions for Vic? Uh, comment from Jennifer Reddy. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Vic, for your presentation and for your thorough engagement in the complex MOU project and process. Um, I, too, just wanted to um, note my appreciation for you and other parents who have been following this process and, and my personal also frustration with the lack of clarity and opportunity to actually influence um, this, this process, and it's certainly something that I want to continue um, investigating and advocating for, especially when we're seeing double construction projects coming up. And as you said, the, the public funds that, that are going into double construction projects are certainly more than frustrating um, and, and stand to be updated with our current knowledge on accessibility, as you mentioned, um, but also equity and, and which students are accessing these programs, whether resource spaces are included or not. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for outlining those pieces and um, uh, that I, I hear your call for advocacy as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your presentation, Vic. Uh, Thanks, moving, thank you. Moving to the next delegation, Himanshu Mehta regarding Fleming School site. Himanshu? Hi, can you hear me okay? I, we hear you fine. Yes, thank you. S sorry, may I go ahead? Please, yes. Excellent. All right. Uh, well, I appreciate everyone. Uh, thank you for your time, uh, Mr. Green, trustees, and members of the Vancouver School Board. I appreciate the opportunity to present our case regarding the disposal of the southern portion of Fleming Elementary. I want to start by saying that I can understand the situation that you're in. You have a problem to solve. There are chronic funding gaps and several capital projects that need to be completed by VSB. However, the trustees have a moral and legal responsibility to be informed and to take the public consultation process seriously. Uh, this should not be a box to check off on a checklist, but a meaningful process of engagement. I hope that my case will convince you that short-term thinking should not guide decisions such as this one. Your decision will have a generational impact on our kids and our community. To start, my name's Heman Mehta. My daughter attends grade one at Fleming and my son will be joining the daycare program as soon as it's open. I mentioned building a house here because our home now houses three family units on a lot that was previously occupied by one elderly gentleman. And I'll touch on this later. Here's what I'm gonna cover in the next 10 minutes. I'll talk about how the VSB survey feedback was ignored and present you with a petition of over 600 signatures that opposes uh, the removal of this land. I'll show the Ministry of Education's own guideline for site area and how the current size of Fleming Elementary already falls short of this. I'll talk about the lack of nearby parks and green space and how other schools compare. And lastly, I'll provide evidence of how the school enrollment was forcefully downsized and suggest we base our forecasts on where kids actually live and will live. South Vancouver is an immigrant community with language barriers and busy parents who are trying to make ends meet. Due to cultural differences, parents are not comfortable voicing their opinion 
In spite of this, we were able to come together as a community. Our family WhatsApp group is over 100 parents strong now, and our Facebook group is that big as well. Only one email was sent to the family regarding the disposal of the land, and no signs were displayed for the community to learn more. Why did VSB not engage the public more? Regardless, we were able to rally the neighborhood to provide 205 responses to the VSB survey in under just a week. As you know, trustees, 72% um, of the respondents said that the Fleming site is required for the future education needs of the district and opposed declaring this land as surplus. 80% of the suggestions support retaining a space for play, learning, community, or future expansion to meet educational needs. Let's take a pause. 80% of the suggestions disagreed with this decision. However, the survey results seem to have been completely ignored as VSB staff is still recommending moving forward with the disposal. It was pretty heartbreaking. We, we had a feeling this would happen. So we put out a petition to save the space. So far, we've collected 615 signatures and that number is growing by the day. Have a look. As you can see, there is a huge opposition to this decision. Please take the time to read the petition comments. Here's what one of the teachers said. And I just wanna say thank you to that teacher for voicing their opinion. Many staff members uh, from VSB have been uncomfortable speaking their minds on this matter. So she said, as a teacher at the school and a local resident, I want the land to be kept for students to play on and for the community to use. If the VSB needs revenue, the BC government should provide more funding. School districts shouldn't have to resort to leasing or selling their land. Regardless of where you stand, no one in this room wants less green space and to reduce an already cramped play area for 400 kids. See the comments about the value of outdoor space or better monetizing existing leases like Kingsgate Mall that VSB owns. We need this land to grow, grow Fleming Elementary as it's already full. So I'll talk about site area. If you look at the BC Ministry of Education's guideline for area standard, Fleming's site area is already too small for 400 students. The proposal to reduce it to 1.65 hectares would actually be 30% less than the required site area for 400 students. The population was almost 500 students just two years ago. So that would have required 2.7 hectares. And I'll talk about the 500 students a bit later on in my presentation. However, in the survey report, the VSB staff countered that there are other schools that are similar in size. So I thought to myself, why don't I just have a quick look? Let's have a look at the first two in the list, Henderson and Brock. Henderson Elementary is right next to Sunset Park, a skating rink and a community center that's three times its size. Jungle Brock is a three minute walk from Riley Park, Hillcrest Community Center and Queen Elizabeth Park which is now going to have a zoo. So basically, Brock's gonna have a zoo in its backyard. Fleming, on the other hand, has an electric substation in its backyard. You can see that there is no green space at all close by. And that leads me to my next point. There are no parks nearby. The closest park to Fleming takes eight minutes walk Memorial is 15 minutes away and you have to cross Knight Street to do so. If you walk to the corner of Knight and 49th, as I do every day when I drop off my kids, it's literally a concrete jungle. At the PAC meeting last week, I heard that Fleming is a have not and a tier two school that could use all the help it can get. A question for the trustees, how many of the 10 selected schools being considered for land sale are on the east side. We have done an FOI request for this, as you know. Is it a coincidence that Fleming was the first one to be picked? 
We have heard that children want full-size basketball courts and a place where grandparents can bring their grandchildren after school. Today, if you look at the north side, there's two tiny basketball courts beside the new school. If you look at the south side, next slide please, uh, the original plan have the basketball courts on the busy 49th street, but introduced a parking lot in front of it for some reason, likely because BSB was always intending to sell that land as surplus. It was then suggested that perhaps we move the basketball courts on Knight Street, where currently there's sloped grass areas that are supposed to help with the noise pollution from this busy truck crossing. But we would not have anywhere else to put them. Here's a possible plan. Um, I just used paint to do it. Would it be so, wouldn't it be so much better if we placed the parking lot closer to 49th and moved the basketball courts closer to the soccer field? The parking lot would still have the same driveway access mentioned in your report. This way, the 400 kids have more space to play and the community gets to enjoy more green space. We also have more room to grow as the new building is already full and we will not be able to keep up with the population increase, which I will cover next. VSB has been forecasting on student enrollment, which makes no sense as the school can easily control this by not admitting more students. Instead, the forecast should be based on where the children live and where they will live in the future. As you know, the city of Vancouver passed a bylaw in 2018 that 99% of the houses are now permitted to build a duplex. Like I said before, our land in the house that we just built has three addresses. We have a family living, a family living in our basement, and we have a young couple living in our laneway. You can see from the 2016 census stats that the number of rental units are increasing. Shouldn't we base our forecast on 2021 census polls that is about to take place? We've all seen the signs on Knight Street and other arterial roads for land assemblies. As our land becomes denser from these zoning changes, where are all these children who live in these new homes going to school? Did you know that just two years ago, the population of Fleming Elementary was almost 500 students? There's a lot of evidence when you speak to the parents that the school, school growth was categorically reduced by canceling programs and removing one of three kindergarten classes. I heard these frustrated and sad stories of, our, of, our, of how families were forced to have their children attend different schools. Parents cited the old principal, Ms. Kent, wanting to reduce the population from 500 to 400 students, which as you can see, VSB was successful in doing. They have full control. Parents loved the intensive French program, for example, but as you can see, the program was canceled because the new building did not have space. Parents were, when they were then encouraged to move their children to a different school to reduce population. Amen. Why did we Amen. purposely build? Amen. Do you know uh, how much longer you, you passed your 10 minute mark already? Sorry, Trustee Pretty Wong, cool. I have maybe one more minute. All right, sure, go Is ahead. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, you know, why did we purposely build a new building to house less children than the old building? Another parent was denied admission for this for their fourth child, even though his three siblings went to the same school in the past. This five year old lives across the street from Fleming, where his parents built a brand new house with a basement suite and a laneway. Can you imagine the frustration and the astonishment the parents experienced when they found out that their son did not win the lottery? There were 59 students registered that year and only 40 were accepted into kindergarten because of the new building. The VSB forecast is flawed and should be overhauled. The VSB and the school has full control over how many it admits 
and the population was systematically reduced to build a school with less capacity. My, and this is my last slide, Trustee Wong. Mer many parents I spoke with in the community are disheartened and disengaged. They believe the public consultation process is a joke and the conclusion is already foregone, especially after the complete disreg disregard of the survey results by VSB. I, for one, believe the value of public engagement and have faith that you as the trustees and other respected stakeholders here will listen and act on the facts that I have presented today. You have a moral and fiduciary duty to engage your constituents and listen to their feedback. Please do not ignore the facts I've laid out before you today and make the right decision. Keep this land for our children and community for generations to come. Thank you, trustees. I can't hear you, Trustee Wong. Thank, thank you, Heeman, for the uh, detailed presentation and the summary at the end as well, as well as the um, the um, the photos with regards to the schools and the uh, the uh, adjoining parks near the schools. Um, if you if you could uh, hold a moment, I'll ask um, uh, committee members if they have any questions for you. Uh, I have a comment first from uh, our Secretary Treasurer David Green. David, thank you, thank you, Trustee Wong, and thank you, Mr. Mehta, for your presentation. Uh, very detailed. Um, that sort of thing. I just wanted to clear up something for the committee members uh, with respect to area standards. The the area standards that are referred to in the presentation did not exist in 1912 when the school was built. Uh, they've only existed for the last uh, about 40 years. And they're meant entirely to deal with, um, you know, suggested school sites for uh, new, new schools being constructed. So I just wanted to clear that up with the committee. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, we did build a new school. But yeah, I guess new sites is what uh, Mr. Green means. Thank you. Uh, I'm just looking at the list here of the chat, if there's any questions or comment. Um, first, Christopher, uh, comment, Jennifer, then Allison. So Christopher first. Uh, QP? Hi. Um, first, uh, thank you, Herman, for all of your work. Uh, <clears throat> it's, um, it's nice to hear that somebody cares so much for their community and has reached out to other people in their community. Um, I've I've only been in this committee for um, about three months now, I think, maybe two or three months. And so I've attended um, three or four meetings. And it was the opinion of the of the vast majority of the com committee members that the sale of public land was a bad idea. It is the opinion of QP15 that the sale of public land is a bad idea um, in general. Um, there should never be a sale of public land permanently because it is a short-sighted plan. And I agree that we should be focusing on when people live here, I've I've said before, I'm a millennial. I, I I'm, there's no chance for me to buy land in Vancouver, and I can't imagine selling land that you already have in Vancouver, because if you if there's any chance that you might need it in the future, um, it's uh, disheartening to hear um, David Green say that um, this the the plan uh, for the area sites is outdated, um, because we do still need space for children a um, hundred years later. Um, so. The pl we shouldn't be reducing the size of a, of a plan that uh, of a site that is already too small and we know is too small. So this is was a bad plan. It's been a bad plan since it was first brought to this committee and it continues to be a bad plan. So that's uh, the opinion of myself and QP. I did talk to uh, my um, uh, the QP 15 um, shop stewards and everything. So that's our opinion on this land. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Christopher. Um, just want to be clear that the, the uh, there's going to be an item with regards to Sir Sanford Fleming um, and as well delegations. I, I didn't, um, with regards to meeting decorum, uh, delegations, it's questions directed to delegations rather than comments back and forth and through the chair rather than using uh, specific names. With regards to comments, uh, Secretary Treasurer was making direct comments with regards to the area standards. So if we can be very clear that this portion of time 
is directed at questions to the delegation. All right. Just to my apologies. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. My apologies. Thank you. That's all right. Uh, Jennifer, question. Yeah, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Iman, for your comprehensive presentation for clearly outlining the consultative efforts that you've also made on behalf of parents in the community who may not have been previously engaged. Um, I also wanted to uh, mention uh, my appreciation for your your mentioning of the neighborhood density and sort of some of the changes you've experienced as a family there. And curious if you could say a little bit more about the kindergarten registration process. Um, as a trustee, I hear different um, pieces of comment on that and experiences from individuals, but you had mentioned um, a little bit and just wondering if you could expand on some of what you're seeing uh, either through PAC or also as an individual parent and wanted to, again, um, clearly state um, that how damaging like the sale of public land really is for a district that is growing in all the ways that you mentioned. Uh, I just really appreciate that you've highlighted uh, some of the contextual factors, including census, that are telling us more. So, yeah, as a question to you, just if you could say a bit more about kindergarten, Reg. Yeah, so, you know, my understanding is my daughter went to kindergarten in the old school and uh, she was able to get in. There was three classes, um, no issues. And then our neighbor right next door, the picture that you saw, um, was was not able to. And uh, unfortunately, you know, they were just told that uh, apply and, you know, hope for the best with the lottery system. And they like you should have seen their reaction when we heard this i think it was last summer when that kid did not get in the mother-in-law the father-in-law everybody was like just flabbergasted that we we live across the street um and they were not able to get in uh, to the school uh, so i don't know if that helps uh, trustee ready um but but yeah it's it's i don't know it seems like it's always very last minute that they find out as well because they're trying to balance the numbers. And my understanding is it's up to us or up to the school to decide if it's two classes or three classes of kindergarten because, like I said, you're able to control that. So I wasn't very clear why if there's 59 students in a wait list, you cut out 19 students um, so that you can make your number of 40. It just didn't make sense. Did you have a follow-up, Jennifer? Or um, no, thank okay? you. Thank you. Um, Allison Vesta. Thanks, Jared. Uh, I really did have a, a comment. I just wanted to say that uh, Vesta certainly uh, supports everything that you've um, brought forward, Mr. Meta, and I hope that you will stay for the remainder of the meeting so that you're uh, able to hear further discussion uh, about this issue. So thank you very much for your presentation. I thought it was excellent. Thank you, absolutely. I'll, I will be tuning into the YouTube afterwards, absolutely. Yes, that comes under item 4.1 later on. Um, so you probably have probably about a half an hour okay. <laughs> in between. Yeah, thank I'll you. let the whole WhatsApp group and Facebook group know everybody's watching this. So okay. all the parents know this is going on and they're watching this live on YouTube. Thank you. Um, David Green, uh, Secretary Treasurer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. You, you cleared up the issue with, um, with Chris. I was, just, um, I was just providing some information to the committee on an inaccuracy that was in the presentation. That's all I was doing. <laughs> thank you, sir. Okay, I'm going to look at my list here. Uh, list is exhausted at this point. Um, just give it a couple of seconds. Oh, there's a uh, deep advice here. Would it be possible to let Mr. Meta know that enrollment is managed by district, not by individual schools and principal? So yes. just to clarify that. That's very clear to me. It's not the principal to, to be. Yeah, I understand that. Right. It's okay. always coming from the top. We all have our bosses. Perfect. Thanks, Amanda. And OK, I think that was the last question or comment. So uh, thank you very much for the presentation, uh, Himanshu. Thank you. And um, we'll watch us later. Thank you. Yeah.
we'll see you on uh, Monday. We'll be presenting on that day as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I, don't, I don't control that agenda. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> okay, bye. All right. Thank you. Um, information item, this was added, and it, it's a good item to add per uh, request from DPAC uh, with regards to the capital plan response letter 2021-2022 capital plan. Um, Secretary Treasury, Treasurer is going to present this one. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a very short report that's in your agenda, and as as the chair has indicated, this was this was put in after the original agenda was um, published on Friday, um, at the request of DPAC. Um, it's a good idea to include this information. Uh, we did receive a uh, capital plan response letter on March the 18th, and it was called an initial capital plan response letter, indicating that there'd be a second one coming in mid-May. And I now understand that new one is coming next Tuesday, probably. Um, so this one just addressed the um, projects that had been uh, submitted in the five-year capital plan for 2021-2022 that was approved by the board last year. And in your report, you can see the SEP projects that were listed. And I want to point out that um, <clears throat> there's many more. There, these are just summary um, summary projects that, you know, they're, they're, the whole list is about... Um, Oh, 15 or 20 different individual projects that um, <clears throat> relate to, you see the different schools there. So there's many different projects related to the different schools. Uh, they total a million nine fifty and $80,000. And then the next slide talks about the requested CNCP projects, capital plan, ca carbon neutral capital plan projects. And we look at these as being <clears throat> heat pump for um, the Bayview Elementary School, a uh, new heating plant for Wolf Elementary, a new heat heat pump for the um, Weir Elementary 75% um, replacement project, a uh, boiler upgrade for McGee, and then some control system upgrades from McCorkendale and Nootka. Um, <clears throat> as you can see from the response letter, none of these CNC projects were approved and only selected projects from the CHC SCP projects were approved. And these are they here. Um, biggest one being the, um, and it, these are all actually tied into the seismic work that's going on with these four schools. Uh, the biggest one being the sprinkler system and emergency lighting for Lord Bing Secondary, the elevator then for um, David Livingston Elementary, and um, the installation of <coughs> Lula's at um, Chief McQuinn Elementary and Lord Selkirk Elementary. And it's explained in the report, Mr. Chair, that um, LULA stands for limited use, limited application hybrid. It's a hybrid between an elevator and a cheerlift, but does provide accessibility for students, and especially in buildings that have more than one floor. Um, as a result of the fact that there were no CNC projects approved, the board did pass a motion at the April 26th public board meeting that's included in your agenda. Um, that the board write to the Minister of Education advocate funding for the from the 2021-2022 CNCP program for heat pumps at Weir and Bayview so that they can be installed during the seismic project construction because to install them afterwards would cost two and three times as much money. I'm happy to say, Mr. Chair, that letter has been written and sent to the minister <coughs> um, earlier this week. And that's my report. Uh, happy to answer any questions. You're on mute, Mr. Chair. I think I'll just leave it on straight now. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, questions, comments? Um, Amanda, quest, uh, comment. I just wanted to express my appreciation for including this, and I'm disappointed in the response from the ministry, but I appreciate that it was presented. Uh, I think uh, most everyone shares your sentiments with regards to the ministry. Um, Janet. Yeah, thank you, Chairperson. And I think this ties into the first presentation we had around um, what, how, when you're doing construction at a site for a seismic project, you should really address the whole of the school and the whole of the site. And um, 
and I, I know that was the intent of the request of the ministry. So it seems to me that the things that were approved were the elevators and electrical and some interior construction at Bing, none of the plumbing and not the roofing. Has the ministry given any rationale for what was approved and what was not approved? And do we have a, I, I know we're waiting for the second letter. So I guess like, I guess the, I was going to say, do we have a, a plan to move forward? But I guess that's a little premature. So the question is, is there any rationale from the ministry for their decision? David? Um, here to Trustee Fraser. Um, <clears throat> I don't really have, I haven't been really given a, a good rationale from the ministry as to why certain of these other projects weren't uh, weren't approved. Um, I know that we did meet with the ministry back in December, staff did, um, talking about, particularly about the CNCP projects. Um, so we were a little surprised that they weren't, uh, they weren't approved in this initial letter. Uh, the other one that I think needs to be, and I, I intend to you know, get back to the ministry about it is the the roofing upgrade for Cavell Elementary because it makes perfectly good sense to do that project while the seismic upgrading of that school is taking place. So, um, uh, but other than that, I don't have any real rationale as to why these other projects weren't approved. <clears throat> Sorry, Trustee Fraser. <laughs> Thank you. But thanks for the um, thanks for sharing that, uh, David. Uh, just looking back at my list there. All right. Nope, that exhausts the list. I will dispense with that item. Uh, before I move over, move on to the restrictive covenant information, I just wanted to backtrack a little with regards to the delegations um, this evening. Um, delegations for committee, mem for the committees, are usually five minutes uh, in length. And um, talking to the um, Secretary Treasurer and myself, we decided we looked at the presentation by uh, Mr. Meta, and um, so we we are flexible this evening, given that there's no other committee um, after this uh, tonight's um, facilities planning committee uh, that we extended that time period for um, Mr. Meta, and as well we are flexible with Mr. Canna, but he. Both are very good. So um, that's just so um, for precedent setting um, that we were we looked at that, and that's why there's a difference. Um, delegations to committees are five minutes usually. All right. Um, discussion item: a restrictive covenant information. This was at the last um, meeting. We ran out of time, and so we've put this one at tonight's meeting. So um, presentation, David's going to be presenting it again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so as the, um, there's a report in your agenda, um, and as you said, Mr. Chair, this was, um, um, this was referred, this was supposed to be discussed at a, um, <clears throat> at the, I guess, the March meeting of the Facilities Planning Committee meeting, what was, the, what was put off the agenda that night to come tonight. Um, it basically relates to a board motion that was referred to Facilities Planning back in February uh, that says that staff seek a legal opinion on the use of restricted covenant attached to any sale to transfer VSP land to a public body. This could prevent any public body to prevent, to which BSB sells land from reselling privately and would ensure that BSB lands remain in public hands forever as per the intent of the motion of January 25th, 2021. So this staff report, Mr. Chair, is basically just a bit of just some information that um, that's been gathered re with respect to restrictive covenants. Um, and tonight, I think the, you know, the, the um, I'm not going to go through the details of it, what, what's in the report. The trustees have had an opportunity to read it. Uh, committee members are, have also had the opportunity to read it. So basically, I think it's back in your hands, Mr. Chair, um, for the committee to either uh, recommend this motion, go back to the board for the board's consideration or not. All right. Uh, thank you, David. Um, all right. I'll open it up um, for questions and comments uh, as it's presented. 
if anyone needs any more information or specifically with regards to page two, where there's more uh, uh, a description or information with regards to um, restrictive covenant and the relationship that the uh, board plays um, with regards to the uh, idea that was presented at the board meeting. Um, Jennifer, uh, is that a question for this this one, or did you want to um, expand on this this um, notice of motion? Um, thanks, Chair. Yes, I have a couple of clarifying questions in the document itself. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and so just curious, my first question is just around some clarification on what, um, you know, and I, I understand, David Green, that you've developed this document um, in response to that motion. And I'm wondering what is your interpretation of the motion that was passed in January by the board and how that's become a part of policy 20? Oh, that became is part of policy 20. We have policy yes. 20 and this is specifically uh, applies to some restrictions with regards to the policy 20. Um, the January 25th motion, um, if that's your question, are you asking as well how your, the other uh, February 22nd applies to it as well? Uh, sorry, I can clarify. So yes, I know um, because of this document that we're reviewing today that arised from the January motion, um, mm -hmm. so the restrictive covenant motion came out of the January board motion, which was around keeping public land public. And so uh, I wanted some clarification from Secretary Treasurer in developing this document, what the interpretation is of how that January motion is now reflected in policy 20. Okay. Oh, so you're asking the Secretary Treasurer. All right. Uh, David, did you want to attempt that? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. To, to you, to Trustee Reddy. Um, the January 25th um, motion is not reflected in Board Policy 20 because the Board has not adopted it to be in Board Policy 20. Um, is it just me? I think. Um, you froze for a moment there, David. Um, we didn't hear for the last few seconds. Okay. Uh, what I said was the January 25th motion is not part of Board 20, Board Policy 20 at this point in time. Um, I, it, 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 um, in Board Policy 20, there is a separate uh, motion that was passed by the Board in 2015 with respect to uh, the sale of, you know, restricting the sale of entire school sites. Um, for permitting the sale of partial school sites. Um, so right now the board actually has a uh, has two competing motions in effect, uh, and this has been discussed with a a parliamentarian uh, because I wanted to make sure that um, <clears throat> you know we knew what how how this how this might impact something going forward. Um, so this this motion um, that was passed on January twenty fifth is not in policy 20. Um, it conflicts in some ways with what is in policy 20 uh, because um, policy 20, and this, this motion talks about not disposing of any of its land by sale or transfer and fee simple in such a way that would decrease the overall value of public assets. Whereas the, po the policy that's in, the, the motion that's in po board policy 20 speaks to um, allowing for partial sales uh, to take place. Um, <clears throat> so, um, like I said, it, it's a conflicting motion. Um, you, the board would have to make some decisions with respect to, do they want to replace this, what's in board policy 20, uh, with this motion? Um, but I think that that's up to the board to make that decision. Uh, sorry, David. Does that mean that with regards to the January 25th motion that was adopted, that we have to clarify that before we proceed? Um, or 
what does that really mean? Okay, Mr. Chair, I think that <clears throat> before we proceed with what I meant was before we proceed with the February 22nd uh, motion um, no, with Mr. regards to restrictive covenant. Mr. Chair, I think the, um, the February 22nd motion, um, you know, seeks, seeks to have staffs, uh, oh, it speaks to having staff seek a legal opinion on the use of restricted covenant attached to any sale um, or transfer of VSB land to a public body. So I think, you know, that, that legal opinion might still be useful because um, even though um, <clears throat> even though the, the intent of the January 25th motion uh, is conflicting with the Watson Board Policy 20, um, the fact that Board Policy 20 exists and the motion that's in it exists, and that motion does relate to um, a possible sale or transfer of land. Um, therefore, you know, do you, do you get a legal opinion on what a restrictive covenant might be used for in that regard? It might be okay. I would think it would need to be okay to, to have that information. But as I've said, the two motions conflict with each other. Each other. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, moving to Barb. Christy Parent. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, I want to try and give an example here. So let's say our board policy said that uh, school, all schools will be painted black and green. Uh, and that's been a policy for a while. And a, a new board, a board says, passes a motion that says that all schools be painted black. Well, it seems to me that that has changed the policy. It's common sense. It's changed the policy. One doesn't need to say um, that that policy, the current policy, be deleted and replaced with because it is, it is it. It is replacing the policy or adding to the policy or whatever. It's not in contradiction because once we've passed this policy, that is now our policy. I, 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 I just think it's, it's not common sense to say that it's not part of policy 20. Of course it is. It's our new policy about what we think of, of uh, sales and leases of land. But I, I guess, Trustee Parrott, we did not um officially formally state that the old policy is removed alan we don't have to by passing what we did that indicates what our new policy is what we believe now i i hear what you're saying i'm just saying that in in the past when we had um changes to policies you know, there's usually a clear remove this, add this. So I know what you're saying, Barb. I'm uh, just making that comment. Um, anything to follow up, Barb? No, thank you. Okay. Uh, Allison Avesta. Thanks, Chair. Um, so I just. I, I have some issues with this um, item. I, I do understand the um, sentiment behind it that, you know, placing a restrictive covenant on, on land will devalue the land because uh, whoever is interested in purchasing it um, wouldn't necessarily want to have the same rules applied to them, uh, they'd probably prefer to uh, use the land in the way that they, they would like to. However, I think that all of the discussions and the, um, the motions that have been passed have been around uh, preserving the land and keeping it in public hands. And so even though it might reduce the value of the land um, in the sense of 
how much the the VSB could obtain for it uh, if they were to uh, transfer it in some way. Uh, I think that um, you know the 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 main objective that we um, certainly the stakeholder pardon me, the stakeholders and uh, the motions that have been, been passed uh, have been aiming for is to ensure that public lands stay in public hands. And so, you know, in that spirit, I, I think we need to look at the covenant, the restrictive covenant, as being something that, uh, although it might not... Uh, it might restrict the amount of money that the VSB is able to obtain uh, for its lands. I think that overall, for public good, um, it would be retaining uh, the full amount uh, because the land would be maintained in public hands. Thanks. Thanks, Allison. Um, Janet. Thank you, Chair. And I. I'll come back to the, I'm coming back to the question of did the motion change the policy? So, you know, the motion is the will of the board, but at the same time, it hasn't changed the policy. So I think maybe what would be helpful if, as we as trustees, ask staff to look at policy 20 to see how the recently passed motion could be incorporated into it so that we do have a very clear policy based on the motions passed by the board. Thank you for that suggestion. Uh, Jennifer, oh, did you want a response, Trustee Fraser, or? No, just making a comment, okay. thank you. Thank you, yes, yeah. thank you. Uh, back to Jennifer. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, yes, I wanted to confirm that, yes, the January motion um, was an amendment of policy 20, so I don't think there's anything further needed there because as an approved motion of the board, about the amendment of policy 20, that would be what is now policy 20, um, uh, similar to what Trustee Parrott mentioned. Um, and I do have in a moment a further motion to ensure the implementation um, of, of some of what we're talking about. And I wanted to just pull from that January 25th meeting where trustees um, spoke at great length about the desire to keep public land public. And just some of the quotes from Trustee Fraser, for example, it's important to keep public land in the public domain. This preserves public land for public use. Um, and further uh, quote is, this is a way to prevent it being sold to private interest um, so that the value of public lands remain as public asset. Um, and, and also from yourself, Chair, uh, quote, that it is most important to keep public lands public. So just wanting to confirm that that was really the spirit and the letter of the motion that was passed in January. Um, and the um, kind of second question I wanted to ask before uh, sharing this uh, substitution, um, or sorry, like supplementary motion, um, is just around what is meant, um, and Secretary Treasurer, if you, if you could answer this one, is around like what is meant when it said that the restrictive covenant could decrease the value, how would it actually decrease the value? David, did you want to respond to that? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, um, <clears throat> restrictive covenant, if a strict covenant against a property will likely decrease the value, as um, Allison referred to earlier in the discussion. Uh, simply by uh, restricting the ability of the buyer of the property to to do something with it. Um, so if there's any sort of restriction on the use of the property that the seller puts on it, and perhaps Trustee Hansen being a lawyer also, but um, my understanding is that, you know, if, if a buyer uh, accepts a, a sale of, of a piece of property that has a restrictive covenant on it, that, you know, the buyer will to pay less for it, um, what he would expect to pay or what what he would expect to pay if he had free title to the property. Oh. All right, moving to Oliver. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, just responding first to 
to uh, David's comment, yes, of course, um, the property would be devalued as opposed to whether there was a restrictive covenant because there's a there's a restriction on it. So it wouldn't be sold or couldn't be sold at fair market value to the highest bidder in a free market. It would have to be limited to uh, obviously sold to another public body. So that would uh, devalue it in the hands of any potential purchaser. But I wanted just to circle back on, again, on this idea of board motion and board policy. Um, it, it doesn't matter what uh, one of the trustees thinks what happened at that motion. If, if the motion didn't uh, amend the policy, then the policy is not amended. And it is possible to have motions that are passed that are contradictory to board policies. Uh, strangely, uh, there's no hierarchy uh, in in the school board where the policies take our hierarchy over uh, the board's motions. They can they can actually be contradictory, which is what we have now. So, if there was going to be uh, a change in the policy, there would have to be another motion brought forward to change it to to marry up this new motion with policy 20. I just wanted to make that comment, Chair, if that's everything. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks, all. Thank you, Oliver. Um, back to Jennifer. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, and so just clarifying then, and, and thanks, uh, Secretary Treasurer, for the further clarification on the, the reduction in the value. Um, precisely, I think that that is what we want to restrict is the private sale of public school board land and that the restrictive covenant would, in fact, ensure that land will stay public um, because as you say the, the the value would decrease because a public purchaser can no longer sell for private interest um, which does fulfill the letter and spirit of the motion in January so wanting to clarify that that right that does check out I think with what the purpose of the of the restrictive covenant would be um. Question, Chris Brown, QP. Uh, Barb Parrott. Oh, Barb. Oh, sorry. Oh, yes. Barb, okay. you're going to eye call, but you didn't finish that off, Barb. That's fine. Thank you. I <laughs> just put it in chat. <laughs> Barb, go ahead. No, thank you, Chair. I don't need to waste the time of the meeting. I just put it in the chat. Okay. All right, Chris, um, QP. Hi, uh, yeah, I had a question uh, through the chair um, about the value of the land. Um, what is the purpose of the land being of a higher value if our intent is not to sell um, public land? Um, because that is what the motion was regarding in January, if I'm not mistaken. What uh, is the purpose of having land be more, uh, be worth more if we are not planning to sell it to buyers? I think that's a comment rather than a question, Chris. Uh, I'll, I phrase it as a question, but uh, sure, okay. Okay, okay. Unless someone someone wants to answer that. Um, okay, David. Did, did David say? Okay, I, I think I'll, I'll consider that as a statement. Okay. Um, back to Jennifer. Thanks, Chair. Yes, and I just wanted to follow up on the piece where um, I'd like to submit a supplementary motion, um, just given the information in this document and the discussion that we've had, um, and would love to hear from committee members uh, of whether or not they would recommend it to the board um, for discussion and debate. A substitution? To, okay, with regards to the motion that starts with that staff seek a legal opinion, do you want to substitute that with something similar or yes. completely different? All right. Um, does, do we have that um, with our staff to put on um, the screen or did you want to just read it? Is it lengthy or? Um, I can just email it. Is Marlene the best person to copy? Put it in the chat. Just put it in the chat. Um, okay, before we go there, I guess I have a point of order. I'll move down to Carmen. 
Yes, thank you through the chair. Um, so I just want to, I know we're having a lengthy discussion and I think it's really important, but just wanted to say we can't submit motions at committee and we can't amend motions at committee. So the motion has to come from the board and we aren't able to change it here at the committee level. So certainly, you know, we're having a discussion and we're discussing what was referred from the board to the committee, but we're not able to make a change to that at this point. We need to discuss the item that's currently in front of us and determine if we're recommending um, or this item is going forward to the board as it is for a decision in May. So I just wanted to make that point of order. All right. Um, now, is there, uh, I should refer to the secretary treasurer if we just, uh, if it was a, uh, a minor amendment or if it's something completely different, is that the call of the chair or do we have some Mr. Chair, the, um, yeah. the recent changes to board policy three uh, preclude the submission of motions at committee level. Okay. In any form. All right. Okay. Um, all right. Trustee Reddy, um, that Thanks. was what was presented. Can you have that at a note as the notice of motion? to the next board meeting. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, just clarifying. So, and just kind of um, wanting to zoom out for transparency and accountability's sake, um, thinking about, so the committee had a chance, so this item came to the board meeting in February, the committee's had a chance to discuss and has given feedback, which would should therefore inform any revisions, edits that committee members might make. And as a trustee on the committee. Um, my understanding is that that would be the purpose of bringing it to committee is to then finesse, adjust, edit, revise before sending it back to the board. Am I missing something? I'm reading that if it's a minor change um, to that, um, I think what is the point of order is that if it was something completely different. Um, so I guess the only way to find that out is um, you know, uh, if, if it's, if it's minor or if it's major, um, to what was presented, something clarifying is, or is it completely off? Uh, it's, it's a minor adjustment. So it relates to what the discussion is and what the staff document has shared. Um, so wanting to make adjustments based on what we've heard. So I would say minor, um, Yes, it's related to the topic and would like it dealt with at this meeting rather than coming to three separate meetings. Same topic. All right. Okay. Um, okay, so I... <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, I guess another point of order, are we going back to uh, trustees asking what... Trustee, before I'm going to um, put it on hold for a little moment, Jennifer, um, just there's chat going on with regards to Trustee Parrott's comments. I call, uh, seems to me that the committee can accept the motion, not support the motion or change. The, seems to me that the committee can accept the motion, not support the motion or change the motion. Is that a point of order question, um, Trustee Hansen? Yes, Chair. Okay. Yes, yeah, so just ahead. like clarity on uh, Trustee Parrott's comment there. I, you know, I, I may have mistakenly uh, taken it in an offensive way, but it it suggests to me that the the next word after that was going to be something derogatory, and um, I would I would hate to feel that that was directed at at me or one of our staff when expressing our views in in this type of committee forum. So I just would like an explanation from. Trustee Parrott. Okay. All right. Um, uh, okay. If, if it, I thought she was going to write, I call the question, but <laughs> it wasn't that simple. Um, did you want to respond to that, Trustee Parrott, or is that, are we going down a rabbit's hole here? Do, do we, we are going. Sorry, I missed what you said there. Okay. 
All right, uh, let's. On? I can hear you. I can. Hello, Barb. Yes. Okay. Did you say we are going down a rabbit's hole if we do that? We are going down a rabbit's hole, but I certainly don't mind replying. All right. Do you want me to reply? If it's within part it, <laughs> the decorum, of yes. Course. Of course it is. Um, I, I, I mean, I don't think, I uh, can't remember what the word was that Oliver used. But I, I don't think uh, I call common sense is um, derogatory. And, it, and if, it, if it is felt to be derogatory, I apologize. Um, but that's all I'm doing here is some common sense. I, I looked up uh, board policy handbook and it says that our policy is, is foundational statements which provide guidance and direction for all activities within the district. And that's what this motion does. This motion is policy, it's board policy, which means that what ha needs to happen is staff needs to look at current policies and and fit it in and make changes that are necessary to our policy handbook to put this policy forward. Okay. All right, okay, let's, okay, we'll leave that at that. Um, just wanna caution everyone to be um, extra sensitive with regards to this because uh, we don't want things taken the wrong way. I'm going to go back to uh, David Green, uh, Secretary Treasurer, with regards to, and I, you know, I don't, I don't want to um, go uh, uh, contrary to Board Policy Three, which was adopted, uh, but at the same time, um, trying to finesse Trustee Reddy's um, rights um, to to and not knowing <laughs> what the, her her substitution motion is going to be um how to figure this out trust uh david thank you mr chair the um <clears throat> i trustee ready has forwarded her motion to um you and i in an email all right and in my opinion By email, okay. Um, I think the, uh, yeah, so I think, Mr. Chair, um, I, I just want to remind the committee that, you know, the motion that was referred to the committee for consideration tonight is the one that's in the agenda that staff seek a legal opinion on the use of a restricted covenant attached to any sale or transfer of VSB land to a public body. This could prevent any public body to which VSB sells land from reselling privately and would ensure VSB lands remain in public hands forever or per the intent of the motion of January 25th, 2021. That is the motion that the committee should be discussing tonight. If Trustee Reddy has, if Trustee Reddy has a, another motion or something that amends this motion, my recommendation is that the committee refer the motion that's in the agenda back to the board and Trustee Reddy Propose her motion, her amendments um, at the at the board table. Okay, um, just give me a moment. I'm just reading over here. All right. Okay. Um, I'm looking at this. That. Okay. So the motion here is that the staff. Seek a legal opinion on the use of, okay? And I'm reading the the um, proposed substitution motion is a direct um, action past this, uh, beyond this initial motion. So um, there's two ways we can deal with this. I think we can, if there is support by the committee, because there's, seems like a lot of um, questions that we can adopt this one, um, depending on what people think, maybe have the discussion on this one. And then I, how I'm reading the um, 
proposed new substitution motion, that that would be a new one that would be presented after. And if this one's passed, then um, we can get information, more legal opinion. Um, so I'm reading it that way. Okay, so I've got a huge list here now. Um, David has a comment. Mm. Okay, go back to David. Uh, David, comment. And then I have Amanda. Oh, point of order from Barb first. Barb? Well, that was fast. Um, I'm reading, and I realize that this hasn't, our policy hasn't been changed, at least the copy I have on the board's website hasn't been changed to say that trustees can't submit motions um, to, to the committee. But our policy does say um, the chair of a standing committee may make motions and speak to any question during committee meetings without leaving the chair. And recommendations of standing committees may be pro proposed by any member of the committee and do not require a seconder. So it's, it seems to me mm -hmm. if, if the committee wanted to move, uh, if a member of the committee wanted the motion that was before us, which David makes a really good point, the motion before us is the one about seeking a legal opinion. But if somebody on the committee wanted to amend that, I think that the policy uh, gives that right recommendations of standing committees committees may be proposed by any member of the committee and do not require a seconder. Okay, I, I and I don't have the policy in front of me, but um, I'll, I'll go back to the secretary treasurer uh, with regards parts to uh, board policy three. Um, I'm not sure if we're looking at different different dates for the policy, but. Um, can a um, committee member move a motion um, with the change with regards to policy three? So you're doing all this on the fly here. I think, Mr. Chair, there may be, um, you know, I know I know that there was a recent change in, in the policy that referred to not accepting motions at committee level and but Trustee Parrott raises some points where there may be um, some conflicting language and other policies, that sort of thing. Um, but my, I go back to my original advice is that, you know, the board, the, the, the motion that the committee is considering tonight is the one that's in the agenda. And I'm proposing that the committee would refer it back to the board for the board's consideration. Uh, Trustee Reddy's um, Trustee Reddy's uh, proposed motion actually, is, I, if I understand it correctly, is it's actually putting restrictive covenants on any sale of lands in order to prevent any purchaser of BSB land from selling it to a private owner. And I would advise the board to, um, before you look at a motion like that, that you actually get a legal opinion. So you actually understand all the implications of, of what restrictive covenants are. Um, so that you make an informed decision at the board level. So again, my recommendation to you is to have the committee refer this motion as in the agenda back to the board for consideration. Now, if Trustee Reddy wants to propose amendments at that point in time, she can do so at the board table. Thank you. Um, okay, let me, let me go back on this list and uh, have a couple of, maybe a suggestion there. So let me go to Amanda. Hi, so through the chair, I'd just like some more clarification on the third point up there on the Board of Education property responsibilities. Is that a legal opinion or the school act? Because we are already reducing the value when we say we're no want to rent to an independent school. We don't want to um, sell, uh, we we'll want to sell to a public one and we want to keep school, um, school properties, public properties. And I mean, parents very much want to keep school properties, public properties. I'm just trying to get some clarification if that recommendation is just a legal rep, um, recommendation based on the school act or where that is coming from. Which, um, you're, you're talking point three on page two of two, right? What impact does 
I'm looking at the, the screen that I see in front of me with the Board of Education Property Responsibilities, the, the slide. The slide 47 of 74. Okay. Um, sorry, I have 48. <laughs> 40, um, so someone... trustees of a school board have a fiduciary duty to preserve the property of a school board. Accordingly, they should not reduce the value of that property or dispose of it without receiving full fair market value. But we already do things that um, prevent us from getting full fair market value, and we're very much in support of the reasoning behind why we're not opening it up to for free trade because we have ethics and moral responsibilities and stuff of wanting to keep public property public and for wanting to promote public education. Right. Uh, agreed. Uh, I, I presume that's a comment rather than a question. Well, I just wanted some clarity if it was just the legal opinion or what part of that was school act and what part of it was legal opinion. Okay. First of all, I don't see 47. I see 48. I'm not sure if anyone can, is something I have to change here or. Let me move the slide back. Yeah. Thank you. That's for the film. Okay. All right. Uh, to you, Mr. Chair, to, I believe, Amanda, that was, um, that comment was put into the report um, based on conversations I had with legal legal counsel, but um, the, the she's also correct that you know the school act or the disposal um, ministerial disposal ministerial order that controls disposal does refer to the ability to you know sell a piece of property to say another school district or an independent school uh, at less than fair market value. So. <clears throat> Um, I guess the comment made, was made here with respect to the, um, you know, in a fee simple sale, the trustee should be aware that they have a fiduciary duty not to preserve or, or I mean, to, to preserve the value of the property. Um, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a situation where fair market value is attainable. Um, but in other situations, like I said, like a sale to a, another school district, uh, where if you don't have to get fair market value, then um, that wouldn't apply. Thank you. Um, all right. So back to where we're at here. Um, trustee Reddy. Um, so prior to the um, substitution motion, um, and I think the motion... Uh, that we're discussing or should be uh, being discussing is the legal opinion. Um, would it be, because um, there's a lot of questions right now with regards to the legal opinion, which is the uh, initial motion that this committee was supposed to discuss, that if we seek, um, if there's support by committee, um, that we get the legal opinion and move it, move that portion of it forward and then once we get that, and um, and I'm not, and I want to judge how the time frame of that. Then at the board meeting, when we have that legal opinion, then we can also go straight into your uh, your proposed motion this evening, which is actually just to outright apply the restrictive covenant. Um, is that fair to? Um, see if committee uh, supports the original motion, because I think that's what we're going to need to do anyways. Yeah, uh, thanks, Chair. Yes, and just a comment um, based on some of the discussion so far. Um, I'm not in agreement of that uh, pathway only because I'm bringing this item to be dealt with as, a, as an item that's been uh, in front of the board since January. So I wanted to keep those pieces together for that reason, that it isn't a a new idea. It's something that arises from January's uh, motion to fully implement um, the intention and letter of that motion to keep public land public. Um, so it would be my preference that we um, recommend to the board this um, language that I, I was hoping to read out was around that a restrictive covenant be attached to any sale of VSB land in order to prevent the purchaser of VSB land from reselling it to a private owner and to ensure that VSB land remains in public hands forever, again, as per the intent of the January 25th motion. So that would be 
in uh, respect of the staff uh, document that was provided that also indicates that it is legal. Um, so yeah, just wanting to clarify okay. the process uh, given that. Right, okay. Well, my, uh, my feeling is that <laughs> um, this one here that we're being discussed might, I, uh, you know, might pass. The other one, I, you know, with regards to point of orders and everything, that that might be uh, completely defeated, not based out of the reason why, but just because it's we're not supposed to have motions brought up. You know, I'm, I'm hearing different variations of the board policy before and after, um, but my concern is, you know, to having a motion defeated based on um, uh, that it's not you know, that it was substituted and not known to the committee prior for it to be coming here. Um, okay, let's let's hear a little more first. Uh, Carmen. Yes, thank you through the chair. I just wanted to say that I am supportive of the restrictive covenant, uh, the motion that was referred to this committee going back to the board, um, but I am not supportive of making any amendments to it at this committee. So uh, as a committee member, I do have, I am in support of the motion that was in front of us in the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, I'll, I'll make that ruling that we look at um, this and then your motion that you are gonna uh, present this evening, um, that to be moved as a note of motion at the board meeting. So with regards to this, the motion that was brought to the committee, uh, I'm looking for the committee members, but before that, um, there was a lot of emails back and forth. Am I missing anybody in the email, uh, in the chat who needs to comment or have a question prior to asking um, the members on this committee? Um, their support of the recommendation or not. Okay, I don't. So I'm gonna to go to committee members. Uh, Trustee Hansen, do you support the recommendation that's before the committee? The one with regards to that staff seek a legal opinion on the use of restrictive covenant attached to any sale or transfer, da 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 da, break the Yes, end. Chair, I support that recommendation. All right, um, Jennifer, do you support that recommendation? Yes, Chair, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Carmen Cho did as well, and I did as well. All right, um, so that motion is going to the board with support from the committee. And, and sorry, and then during that process as well, um, on a side note, we, we need to clarify board policy three and I'm getting conflicting information, which puts me in a very awkward position at this point. Um, but that's going to the board. Um, Allison, you have a clarifying question based on the discussion. Yeah, sorry. I'd actually, uh, to you, Chair, it, it uh, was about policy three, like, and around the process about uh, if, if trustees are not allowed to bring motions through the committees anymore, when is the opportunity for stakeholders to have uh, their voices heard um, regarding any motions that are going to the board? I think the, the point is that it was supposed to be from the board to the committee and then back to the board. That I think that's the process. Um, this one in particular, because there was, everyone was geared toward a discussion on a particular motion and then there's um, the, the substitution motion was to move it one step further. And so you're right. Um, that's with regard to board policy three, because I'm hearing some comments that, okay, you can, some comments that you can't. So that, that I need to uh, clarify as well. So in, in the meantime, uh, that's my ruling what is what was presented this evening. So I'm not, I'm not saying that that's um, you know, set in stone, 
I'm saying that we need to clarify board policy three. Thanks, yeah. Chair. Thanks for the comment. Okay. Um, uh, all right. So I'm not sure if Barb has a comment or she was just saying that. Um, maybe we start from if anyone has any comments at this point because <laughs> I, I this list is i mr chair yes mr chair i um, david i have um made a note and i will um have staff we will go through the policy changes that were made recently with respect to motions urgent motions that sort of thing and also to um explore or find out where the conflicts may be in our policy handbook um with respect to the responsibility or the right of a committee chair to do something with respect to motions that Bar Trustee Parrott is referring to. So um, I've taken that away, Mr. Chair, and um, Thank you. we can bring that back at a later date to get some clarity. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, thank you. All right. Let's move ahead. Um, item 4.1. Southern portion of Sir Sanford Fleming school site surplus declaration consultation process. Uh, David Green and John Dawson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, before we, um, before we, um, you know, start, we have a PowerPoint tonight. Uh, there's also a lengthy staff report in the agenda that um, I hope trustees and stakeholders have an opportunity to read. Um, you know, this um, motion, th this report has been referred to committee. Um, the board did adopt a motion at the February 22nd board meeting that, that the board approved proceeding with the initial uh, consultation process as described in board policy 20 uh, to consider the potential declaration of the southern portion of Fleming site surplus to the educational needs of the school district. Um, I want to emphasize that you know, and as, as the presentation will 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 say that you know, we're not talking about the disposition tonight. We're talking about the declaration of it being surplus to our needs. Uh, so, I just wanted to clarify that. I'm going to pass it to John Dawson now to run through this PowerPoint. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Secretary Treasury Green, and, and through the chair. Um, so, so the report does provide information on items in relation to the board motion, which Secretary Treasurer Green just read out. Um, it details the consultation and engagement process and the feedback received uh, through that process. It also uh, outlines planning considerations identified by staff as relevant to the recommendation before the board uh, to declare the southern portion of the Fleming site as surplus to the educational needs of the district. Um, this, this slide so that the previous slide just illustrates the policy has two distinct phases and we're really focusing on the first phase tonight. And the phases are sequential, uh, meaning that if, if the, without proceeding with the first phase, the second phase isn't initiated. So uh, back to that timeline on to the next slide, please. So here's the timeline we've been on. This was um, a graph that was presented in the uh, report to the facility planning committee on March 10th. And uh, so the, the focus of tonight's report is on, on phase one. Next slide. So we did uh, conduct two online engagement sessions, public engagement sessions um, as, a, as, as one phase of our engagement. Uh, these sessions were attended by 67 participants. Uh, the communications plan or the promotion plan for these engagement sessions is detailed in, in the board report, beginning on page three. Um, this, both sessions were structured in the same way. They began with a presentation by staff and a re representative from the urban systems team um, where we outlined, uh, you know, what I guess off the, off the top, I'd say the overarching message of the presentations was an invitation on how to, to provide feedback through the survey. So um, anybody who attended those presentations was encouraged to provide their feedback through the survey as well as through questions at the presentation. Uh, and and other, other avenues were provided, as I mentioned before, to um, get, get to the survey, including developing a website, uh, which links directly to the survey. 
So we began the presentation with uh, a description of Policy 20, uh, the timeline for the process, what work had been done to date, uh, an enrollment forecast for, for Fleming and surrounding schools. Uh, we delved into you know, what the new school is like and, and site considerations and, and uh, what the site would look like now and what it looks like, could look like in the future. And we also provided some context about an overview of uh, what land asset management is and some of the potential development concepts uh, for the site. Um, after the staff presentation, uh, participants were invited to submit questions through a moderator. This is a tally of the number of questions um, themed that were submitted uh, over the course of both presentations. And I, I believe that at the time of the presentation, staff answered approximately 40 questions. And there is a complete transcript of the questions submitted during both presentations available as an attachment to this report. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned already, the, the sort of second phase of the engagement was the feedback survey, which was opened on the day of the information sessions, and it was remained open until April 28th. Uh, 205 individuals completed the survey, and, and one of the questions was simply to do identify yourself, which, which group you fell into or which category, and here were the top three groups um, represented in the survey, which represented, you know, as you can see, 82% of the uh, survey of the people who completed the survey were in one of these three groups, the largest being local community residents with no children attending a VSB school or, or a K-12 school. So the survey, you know, there's two clear, clear findings from the survey um, that were mentioned uh, by the delegation as well. 72% uh, of the respondents to the survey disagreed with the statement that the south portion of the Fleming site is not required for the future educational needs of the district. So clearly there's um, opposition in the community declaring this site as, as being surplus to the educational needs of the district. And then uh, a majority, 57% of respondents disagreed or somewhat disagreed with the statement uh, that they support using uh, proceeds of disposition, a long-term lease or a sale, uh, to, to fund the SB capital projects. So there's opposition to using funds generated through the survey um, to fund capital projects as well. The survey, in addition to uh, six kind of closed questions, uh, it had two open-ended questions. The first open-ended question was you know, to invite people to provide their suggestions for repurposing the site. And here's the response we got. Um, a large proportion of respondents obviously favor retaining that site at 49th and night as green space. The middle uh, category there is, is interesting in that that would require, most of those ideas would require disposition to, to realize those ideas. And then, and then um, suggestions about programmed outdoor space, such as you know, basketball courts, uh, tennis courts, and so on, were also put forward by the public. And then the final question of the survey was just open to provide any additional thoughts. And, and here's the top three themes. Um, there's a complete breakdown of the themes in the report. But these are the top three themes that the public identified um, as, 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 as that part of the feedback. So just want to walk through some, some of the um, considerations uh, from staff, finding considerations from staff with respect to um, the Fleming site including a little bit of information about the enrollment forecast and the school capacity and actually where the school is sited currently. Some information about outdoor space and student safety. Um, there's been a review of information about nearby parks, but we can, we, that will come up again. Uh, what the board might consider doing with any capital generated through a disposition and, and how um, this might align with uh, board's commitment to long-term community benefits. So um, I, I think I want to just pause on this one a little bit and talk about where the new school is situated. Um, the new school is situated at the extreme northeast corner of the site. So it is actually as far from the intersection of Knight and 49th as you can reasonably get on, get on that site, be on that site. And the school is designed in such a way that classroom space is on the east and north side of the school again, as a sort of a noise and, and environment mitigation factor in recognition of the busy nature of both those roads. 
Uh, this school is also situated below grade um, in order to mitigate noise at the site and, and improve the overall environment at the school. So, so careful consideration has been gone into the siting of that school away from that, that busy intersection. Um, the school enrollment has declined by 91 students since uh, 2017, uh, as, as the delegation noted. Um, really, the enrollment at the school is, is not entirely germane to whether the site is declared surplus, um, because there really will only be one building on that site. And, and the size of that building is the current size and the building has no uh, capacity for expansion anywhere else in the site. But I think just for context, I'd like to give a little explanation about what's happened with enrollment at Fleming. Um, as you can see, there was an enrollment bulge leading up to 2016, 17 and 2018 in the report. And then enrollment has declined since then. Staff was aware that moving into the new school, the new school would be smaller than the old school. This is often a consequence in the seismic mitigation program of opting for a replacement school because to get to the least cost option, um, it often means reducing school capacity. With that in mind, staff wanted to endeavor to do everything possible to accommodate Catron students at that school. And we understand the level of disruption this causes for families when they can't attend their Catron school. So um, we did a couple of things, but I, you know, looking at youth population in, in the Fleming attachment, youth population is actually in decline and the birth rate's in decline. So in spite of the development that's been alluded to, uh, buildings don't equal babies in Vancouver. And so the population truly is in decline. And the population decline actually accounts for a loss of about 40 students at the planning site in, in, in the past three years. And then staff did manage the enrollment, as was indicated. And we managed the enrollment by restricting uh, out-of-catchment enrollment. And so the out-of-catchment enrollment plumbing has gone from 127 down to about 83 now. So that accounts for another 40 or so students. So between population decline leading to enrollment decline and enrollment management to maximize the number of catchment students um, that can attend funding, that accounts for most of the decline that's noted, noted there, those 91 students. So part, part management and part demographics. Um, now, staff was also aware that it would be a bit of an enrollment blip last year. And it truly was a blip. There was 59 applicants for 40 spots. Um, that appears to be a one-year phenomena. Uh, the school is currently organized into 17 divisions, which is one fewer than the number of classrooms. And, you know, again, there were students placed last year uh, at nearby schools, all students that wish to be accommodated at nearby schools. But uh, this year, the current wait list is about four students. And, you know, past experience indicates all Catherine students at Fleming will be able to be accommodated at school by September. And looking at the enrollment forecast and, and what's going on in that, um, that relatively small catchment, uh, we feel that uh, building will accommodate catchment enrollment in the future. So we actually feel, feel we are planning for where students live and will live in the future. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the delegation already, already reviewed the local parks, so I won't dwell on that but there's the distances to the parks and they're, they're sort of distributed around the catchment ones in the, you know, Tecumseh's to the Northeast and Gordon's to the East and, and then Memorial Park is, is to the West. Um, outdoor play space, I think that's, that's a, a real consideration um, in terms of evaluating this proposal. Uh, here's some notes about this and the area standards. You know, the area standards have been around for 40 years and, and most BSB sites were constructed well before the area standards. And they really were designed to guide the construction of new schools. I will say also in the area standards that there's an indication that for a school with this size, a play field space of one hectare is appropriate. And you know, with some rough calculation, if you take away the building footprint and you take away the parking lot, uh, even with the disposition, there'd be about 1.3 hectares of outdoor um, play space remaining on that site. Uh, the south end of the site does present some, some challenges um, in terms of supervision. Uh, you know, there has been concern from staff over the years about just the pure safety of that in terms of, of the traffic flowing through that intersection, the potential for an accident. But the parking lot will visually separate that south end of the site, and, and there'll be landscaping that also visually separates it. So it'll be kind of isolated from the rest of the schoolyard, and it will also be uh, loud and prone to exhaust from the uh, surrounding roads. 
Um, you know, there's a bit of a section of the report around uh, what high quality outdoor play experiences, how to create those for children. And uh, of course, having adequate space is, is a consideration, but so are other features such as natural elements, the accessibility of the play space and, and, and better design uh, features. So that can be important as well as the straight up availability of space. Next slide, please. So, you know, the impetus for this is, is um, clearly to obtain some capital revenue to uh, enhance other capital projects undertaken by the board. So we, we heard pretty, pretty clearly through the, the survey that, you know, along and through the questions at the um, online sessions, that a long-term lease would be the favoured option for disposition, and that would retain the land in perpetuity in the um, jurisdiction of the PSB. Uh, revenue from a long-term lease could be used to further enhance the Fleming site with some of those um, uh, ideas that are being generated through the school community uh, with, with the support of the principal of how the site could be enhanced, including, you know, further sound mitigation, landscaping, um, and, and, and uh, play features, uh, including gardens that could be funded with revenue generated from the site. Uh, Long-term leasing is consistent with the land asset management strategy of the City of Vancouver and a long-term lease, as I mentioned already, would retain site in the hands of the SP. One of the other themes that, you know, has emerged through the process is the idea of, you know, long-term benefits versus short-term gain. Um, so the, you know, the surplus declaration of the south portion of the Fleming site followed by its disposition, really does exemplify a long-term commitment by the DSP uh, to enhance the district and City of Vancouver through the provision of modern, safe and healthy public amenities in the form of schools. Schools are a public amenity, and by providing better schools, we are providing uh, superior or improved public amenities. And then the other uh, big long-term piece is the availability of capital revenue Will enable the board to leverage funding available from the ministry to enhance current projects in its seismic mediation program and future projects in the board's five year capital plan, which will serve current and future generations of PSB students. Uh, two, two quick points on that. One is I think this actually relates to the very first delegation and some of the challenges that Mr. Kanna outlined at the current MOU and how it, and how it um, actually is operationalized. So the availability of extra capital revenue would, would, would make many of these projects to uh, lead them towards the first option. And uh, I guess um, the second point on that one, which I lost my thread of thought on, so I'll just go to the final slide. So as I mentioned, the, the uh, report does come with a recommendation and it's recommended that the Vancouver School Board declare the southern portion of the Fleming site surplus the educational needs of the district and authorizes staff to proceed with the disposition process. That concludes the report. Uh, with the chair, thank you very much uh, to the committee. Great. Thank you for um, the report, John, and, and the whole process leading up to the report as well. Um, let me, before I open it up, I, the board has a, a special board meeting at seven o'clock. It'll be a very short meeting. So let me ask either the chair of the board, secretary, treasurer, or the superintendent, um, the ability to, I, and I guess those who are con controlling the technical aspects of all of this, um, to uh, suspend at seven o'clock this meeting, do the board meeting for about 15 minutes and then come back and um, uh, continue on with this committee meeting? Is that a possibility? Um, thank you through the chair. Um, I would suggest that we just carry on with facilities and complete this meeting and when this meeting is over we will conduct uh, the second meeting but I think it's fair to everybody who's here all the stakeholders that we just carry on and we okay. will start the other meeting when this concludes. Okay so there's there's not an issue with that seven o'clock meeting be be extended till 7.30 or something like that. Is that? I'm aware okay. of, unless Secretary Treasurer, you have a different opinion? It's, um, 
uh, to the chair, to Trustee Wong, the um, seven o'clock meeting is, is is on the agenda as a public meeting. Okay. Does that mean we have to be there at seven? We have to attend that meeting at seven. Is there still a technical person on this meeting that I can answer that question? Can we defer the start of the public meeting till seven thirty? Marlene, are you on this meeting? Yes. <clears throat> okay, I don't think I don't think we have a technical person supporting us anymore, so I don't know the answer to that question. F. Ruse or Sir um, F. Ruse or Taylor, can one of you answer that question, please? Okay, you, Marlene is saying she can update the time on the website. Okay, so go ahead and okay. do that. Okay, all right, thank you. So we'll we'll just continue on with the facilities planning committee meeting. All right, thank you, John. Once again, I'll open it up for um, questions and comments uh, for this item. Uh, keep in mind there is a motion um, on the floor for the committee members to discuss. Let me get back to my. Okay. All right. So if anyone has any questions or comments, um, send it through chat. Uh, hey, Allison uh, Vesta has a comment. Allison. Thanks, Chair. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, again, reiterate my thanks um, uh, to Mr. Mehta for his excellent presentation at the beginning of this. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, it, it does very clearly lay out um, the opposition to um, declaring uh, this portion of the school site uh, surplus. Uh, Vesta passed a motion um, at the executive level, uh, but in consultation with uh, the teachers at Fleming, uh, that we object to the disposal of the south portion of the Fleming school grounds. And I understand that uh, we're not talking about the disposal right now, but uh, this surplus declaration would be the, the first step in... Um, moving forward with that. And uh, I think that uh, it's quite clear, especially, you know, with the um, satellite photos, uh, that there is a lack of green space uh, in the neighborhood. And so it, it would be a public good to uh, maintain that as uh, part of the school ground uh, that could be kept as uh, natural or um, like uh, Mr. Meadows suggested, move the uh, parking lot uh, to that end and have the green space larger and more uh, contiguous with the uh, rest of the school grounds. So there wouldn't be any problem with the supervision. Um, with regards to the declining enrollment, um, this is, you know, the management of enrollment through uh, limiting the number of kindergarten classes is uh, something that we've seen uh, in many other situations. Uh, that was uh, basically how Henderson Annex was closed as well as uh, some, some of the other uh, schools. Um, and so you know, we we really believe in neighborhood schools and would like to uh, see uh, that continue. And not obviously, uh, Fleming is not going to close, but um, you know, the the question about the decline in, in enrollment is, um, I would say, still debatable. Um, 
with regards to um, Vesta's policy about um, uh, scale sale of school properties, we're opposed to uh, the sale of any school school properties. I realize that uh, there is also, you know, the possibility of um, long term leases that are being floated as well, but. Uh, in the meetings that were held on April 13th, uh, the uh, number, the amount of funds that could be raised were based on a uh, sale of the properties. So, um, just one further question too. There was uh, something in the report around the sale that uh, talked about the um, the appropriate outdoor play space. And I'm just wondering if uh, through the chair, uh, senior management could uh, provide some of those sources uh, that they used uh, in putting that report together. Thanks. Um, all right, With regards to outdoor play space. Um, uh, let's, uh, rather than answer the question here, I guess that's page 11. If there's any, um, we can send that out later. I'm just cognizant of the time for a meeting that we already pushed by half an hour. So if that's all right with you, Allison, with regards to page 11, research on outdoor play space, and we'll, we'll get that out to you. Great, thanks. Um, thank you. Um, Jennifer, Barb, and then Amanda. Thanks, um, Chair. Yeah, I have thank you. Sorry. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, yes, I have two questions. One is possibly related to the item that Allison just raised. And it, my question is just around um, why that portion of Fleming wouldn't be considered of educational value um, when we have considered it for educational programming before um, and have used it in that way. Why would it be changed now? So if that could be a part of the response, um, that would be appreciated. Um, and my second question, if we could um, clarify this here was just around the purpose then of the consultation. How had the consultation results influenced or informed the final recommendation? Uh, I guess that's for each trustee um, to, to view and analyze that. Uh, moving to Barb. Barb? Yep. Thank you, Chair. Um, <laughs> My question is related to the survey. Um, we're, I read in the report that it was the survey was mentioned on the website that it was on the website and at the consultation two consultation meetings. Did a letter go home to Fleming parents about the the consultation process? So through the chair. Um, the principal communicated the whole process uh, via her regular communication uh, procedures, which would largely be the Fleming website versus a paper letter. Um, and I also met with staff on the morning of the online sessions just to both encourage and invite staff to attend those sessions and encourage them to provide their feedback through the survey. Uh, the PAC chair also attended that meeting. And these, the, the engagement was largely promoted through social media and through also a district news story. Yep. On, on the district website. Thank you. Uh, Amanda? Okay, I'll just read what you have here. Amanda <laughs> says, comment, would like to see a graph based on outdoor space per student, as this would be a better comparison than school site size regardless of school capacity, outdoor space per student. Yeah, that sort of ties in with Allison's comment about play space per student. Okay. Well, through, through the chair, um, as you can see in the chart in the report, there's a, you know, there's a very wide variation of enrollment in play space, and there's no actual correlation that I can see in Vancouver between the size of a site the size of the play space and the number of students. But, and, and so what I'm asking for is, is easy, easy to do um, and, and can be done. But 
what you also observe when you observe children playing is they don't spread out evenly on the play space. They play in clusters, grade group clusters, social clusters. So again, the absolute amount of play space and the way it's used are, are two different things. But uh, more than willing to provide a ratio of meters squared per child um, to inform the conversation. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, Janet, Jennifer, Allison, and then Terry. Janet? Thank you, Chairperson. And um, I'd like to, you know, just say that, you know, the reason, the, I think the core reason behind this is that the Ministry of Education does not provide the capital funds that we would like to see in the district. They also don't provide the operational funds we'd like to see in the district. So this does put trustees in a difficult position of trying to do their best we can for students across the district. And also on the, on the control piece, we don't, for seismic projects, you know, the district is not controlling the size of the new school builds, the number of students they com can accommodate. That is generally directed by the Ministry of Education to be the same size or smaller than the current school capacity. Um, and I, th I think this, you know, this is a situation that has not been contemplated in the district for a long time. So it does bring up a lot of questions. It does bring up a lot of questions about equity. You know, we have, um, and, and obviously the Fleming School community, you know, cares a lot about their school and their students and, you know, the school grounds that they have available to them. Um, but also a challenge is not all our schools are seismically upgraded and not all of the upgrades come with a replacement school. Um, not all our schools have the size of the grounds that Fleming does. And how, how, do, we, um, how do we think about that, those aspects of equity and making a decision like this? And how do we think about community benefits of open space in you know in the in the survey there were other comments about how that land could be used for community benefits so you know I appreciate the comments from the stakeholders I really appreciate the presentation I know we're going to get another one on Monday and it's um, it's a, certainly a lot to take away and think about. Thank you, Janet. Um, Jennifer, Allison, and then Terry, and then I'm going to cut it off there because we still have one more agenda item after that. So, Jennifer? Thanks, Chair. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Thanks. So, just clarifying, you mentioned, I just wanted to follow up because my question wasn't answered about the purpose of oh. consultation. So, you mentioned Sorry. that it would be up to the trustees. So, does that mean that the consultative results we saw tonight isn't included in the recommendation before the committee and would still need to be integrated? Or can you clarify that? Uh, all the information is put before you with regards to the report, which is a pretty extensive report. And then with on top of that, the um, comments from stakeholder groups um, will base all that information on each trustee's deliberation uh, when it comes to the board. So the recommendation is that the Board of Education declare the southern portion of the Fleming School site surplus to the educational needs of the district and authorizes staff to proceed with the disposition process as per board policy 20. So um, all the information that's in, um, it's, it's each, up to each individual trustees to, to review that. Follow up? Sure, yes. Thanks, Chair. Uh, okay, so that that's um, clear there that it still needs to be integrated by trustees. Um, and I think, yes, just pointing out as well that a note that policy 20 uh, remains unchanged in the portion of this presentation as well, just in connection to the last discussion we had around keeping public land public and noting that that, that wouldn't be reflected in this presentation or the reference to policy 20. Um, and again, just underscoring that any sale of public school board land would would severely limit our ability to use it for educational programs forever, um, regardless of current or even medium trends of lowered enrollment or enrollment management, um, that it would still severely restrict future boards from, from making uh, educationally sound decisions. Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Allison? Uh, just yes. a, a, a comment that... Uh, 
We were contacted uh, by uh, some teachers at the uh, Fleming site saying that, in fact, the uh, survey was not posted on, on the website, that it was uh, only posted in a my ed, um, so I guess, through Teams site, uh, but not on the main uh, website. So uh, I'm not sure exactly how that is different, uh, but uh, if through the chair, uh, John Dawson could comment on that. Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, the website, which website advertised? Through, through the chair. Um, there, there's no connection between the survey and, and MyEd or Teams. Um, and the link, to the Fleming project site was uh, available you know, through many venues, uh, including the, the slide presentation of the online um, information sessions through social media, through the district news story, and, and so on. And so that would take you to the Fleming project page where there was a link to the survey. So uh, I'm not uh, clear on what um, the stakeholder heard from staff, but we did our uh, best to make the survey available and encourage and invite participation and, and fairly represent the results. Thank you, John. Uh, Terry, uh, VSTA, you have the last word or last question. Thank you, Chair. I, I would, uh, I've actually got a, a comment and then a question if, um, sure. if that's okay. So. I would just like to um, bring to the attention of the committee, I think something that I've mentioned before, but our VSTA, the Secondary Teachers um, Executive Committee, did two years ago pass a motion opposed to the sale of um, any school uh, school property in whole parcels or partial parcels. But I, I do have a, a question as well. And I'd like to um, just um, touch base on consultation with uh, the Indigenous uh, communities. I understand that they were they were reached out to as part of this process. I also understand that under the um, auspices of the land and asset strategy discussions, there's some um, work being done on that with a view to uh, acknowledging within our uh, reaching out to our Indigenous communities. I believe in this case, it would be the Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh. Um, in our reaching out to them, some acknowledgement of our uh, recognizing UNDRIP, and perhaps uh, going forward, some acknowledgement of some form of, um, of Indigenous title to our properties. That's as we um, start our meetings, uh, recognizing that we perhaps don't have a clear title to our properties. I'm just wondering if in the consultation that took place in, in this case, if there was any uh, efforts to move in the direction that we uh, imagine um, that uh, we will be heading towards as we um, do more work in this area. And that's a question uh, to you or uh, to be delegated by you through you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, thank you Terry. Um, I'm just trying to read this report and I'll, I don't have uh, anything directly to respond with regards to Fleming specifically. I was wondering if, if staff or the chair of the board has anything um, specific to to Fleming with regards to reaching out to the Indigenous community or is um, or are we looking at sort of a broader um, discussion with the Indigenous community? Uh, Mr. Chair, I can speak to some of that if you. Thank you. Um, yes, David. The um, uh, for this for the Fleming um, consultation, I know that um, you know we reached out to all of the First Nations. Um, uh, so that was that was they were you know they were part of the process. They were aware of the process on the overall land and asset strategy process that's going on in the district. Um, we've had conversations with. Uh, First Nations about developing protocol agreements, which would include, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, issues related to land. And um, we are about to um, um, issue, we're about to send letters directly to the, to the three First Nations, um, well, particularly uh, the Musqueam, um, to talk about, um, you know, having them involved in conversations about our land and asset strategy as we move forward. Great. 
Thank you. I'm um, sorry for rushing this, Terry, and um, but uh, trying to get everything through. Um, but that was a good question. All right. So I'm going to look for the trustees on the committee with regards to the recommendation. Uh, Trustee Hansen. I'm in support, Chair. Thank you. Support. Trustee Reddy. Not in support, Chair. In support. Trustee Cho. In support. Thank you. And um, I'm also really in support for myself. All right. So this will go to the board uh, next board meeting uh, with support from the committee on the recommendation. All right. So um, we have a meeting at 7.30. So 4.2 Vancouver Project Office Memorandum of Understanding, the MOU. Um, and there's one coming. This one's for June 1st starting so we have to get this one through tonight david uh, thank you mr chair so the staff report is in your agenda which i hope trustees and stakeholders had a look at uh does outline the history of this process that we've gone through um going back to 2019 <clears throat> when the board initially uh wanted to engage the ministry in a renegotiation of the mou for the uh, seismic mitigation pro program um <clears throat> and then it goes on from there where the work that we did with trustees um, that were reported out on. And these, these um, former reports are attached in the agenda for um, for your reference. Also, the letter that we have in the industry. And on the report itself, um, summary of the, the first point I think of having a uh, trustee sit on the steering committee as a non-voting member. And any other negotiation points that, that have been administered to change the, um, the BSB roles and responsibilities to no longer require a long-range facilities plan to be submitted for approval, but just to be submitted annually. Um, I mentioned about the non-voting trustee. Um, they're willing to add to clause 2.17 uh, this the sentence that um, ministry will supply life cycle costing and deferred maintenance to Treasury Board along with the lowest cost option for Treasury Board decision. So I think that's a bit of a um, uh, step forward in, with the, to the ministry's position. And you have to understand, uh, Trustee Wong and, and committee members, that it's not the Ministry of Education that makes these decisions about whether a uh, funding project is um, or a SOSB project is, is funded, it's the Treasury Board's decision. And so the ministry has now indicated that, you know, they will pass along life cycle costing, deferred maintenance costing to the Treasury Board for their consideration. Um, there was another recommendation that the cl a clause be included to include actual escalation cost of projects, and the ministry has not agreed to that. Um, es you know, escalation uh, estimates must be included in the business case as they're not under control of the ministry. And then, with respect to the project timeline uh, being included as a schedule to the MOU, um, you know, the, the timeline that is, that's on our website has been shared with the ministry at the VPO steering committee level. Uh, and they've only partially agreed to that, indicating that um, they didn't really want to include this as an appendix because the timeline um, that's, that we've come up with basically looks at a, um, a complete project from, you know, time of when we first get um, approval for the ministry to do a PDR or concept plan uh, right through to actual giving approval and construction and opening up and that sort of thing, which might take, you know, five, six, seven years. Um, and they point out quite rightly that some projects take uh, a lot less time than that. So um, as I pointed out in the, in the, in the report, like projects like Selkirk and McQuinn are, are quicker projects, um, that sort of thing. Uh, other matters were discussed. Um, it was proposed that the MOU would be for three years, as you stated, from June 1st. Um, letters of application could be developed to address some of the more operational matters that um, that may not be suitable uh, for the actual MOU. Um, so they could be, you know, separate ones for elementary projects and secondary projects, given that there's differences in timelines. And uh, there's also been consideration of inviting a representative from City of Vancouver to attend meetings of the steering committee on an as needed basis to discuss project concerns around permitting times and make clarity on bylaw rulings, et cetera. And I'm happy to say, Mr. Chair, that that was just at our recent uh, 
the city leadership meeting on April 29th. And uh, so to that meeting, um, there was a meeting between the ministry, uh, the ministry, the city, city manager, the staff, and our staff. And uh, we have agreed that I'm, I'm going to reach out to the city to um, explore how that could happen and how we could um, have somebody from the city attend steering committee meetings on a, on a regular basis. Uh, rise. So, Mr. the report in your um, <coughs> contains a recommendation that the facilities planning committee recommends to the board that the revised MOU, which is attached for your reference, uh, for the Vancouver Project Office be approved. Thank you, David. I'll open it up. Um, this has come to the committee before uh, with regards to what um, the committee members wanted um, during the review with the with the with the ministry. And so uh, we're cutting it down to the wire with regards to re-signing uh, for three years. Um, five years is, I think, with the other districts, but uh, three-year uh, MOU. So I'm going to open it up for um, questions or comments. To me, the it was the um, the one that um, the actual escalation costs. I think was the trustees had a had a multiple trustees had comments with regards to that. So that 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 is a was a big issue, and I think we'll have to keep a close eye on that one um, with regards to escalation costs. All right, so let's open this up here. Um, Jennifer, then Janet, and then Amanda. Jennifer, question. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, just um, drawing on what this presentation is, but also the first delegation, Vic, who spoke about the possibilities and sort of the variety of ways we can approach this and just wondering how committee would love to hear from committee members um, thoughts on moving an edit to this to amend the term to one year um, would love to hear what other folks are thinking and whether our committee could recommend that all right um janet janet fraser Yes, thank you, Chair. And um, yeah, I appreciate the presentation we have, but I think there is, I don't, the MOU is more of a mechanism for how we work with the ministry and not a mechanism, uh, not a way in which we can change the rule book. So, I, you know, we certainly want to continue to change the rule book. And I see the comment from the, from um, Deepak that if the VSB is considering uh, adding funds to a project to move from a, uh, you know, an upgrade to a replacement up is very much like that to be part of the public discussion. I, and I think in having that, um, the ministry has not agreed to having that discussion publicly. But I think that is something we can certainly put some thought to about how we can do that work and I think you know maybe the land and asset strategy can help with uh, setting some principles around how we make decisions as a board. Thank you Janet. Um, so Deepak's comment, appreciate that life cycle costing and the deferred maintenance is now considered by the province in the latest signed MOU and would like that amendment to get stronger by becoming a weighted consideration. 2.17, we are aware the MOU will likely not sway from area standards when determining funding, but strongly feel parents and other stakeholders should get to weigh in when VSB is considering adding funding to a project on where those funds should go. While 2.5 says VSB cannot publicly present a preferred option until there is an approved option, it doesn't say that all options cannot be presented unbiasedly. Thank you, Deepak. Amanda, uh, David. Uh, Mr. Chair, to respond to, I just want to remind the committee that the um, the current agreement has already been extended to expire on June 1st. It was due to expire last August, so I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you, David. Um, with regards to the um, reduction of the agreement from a three to one year, 
Um, yeah, I, I think that would be basically asking for another extension. Um, my concerns are same as the five-year capital plan. Uh, when you ask for these, you uh, it's very cautious of what you're what you'll get. And my concern is the province will agree to everything, but the concern is we'll agree, but it'll hold off and everything. And I, I understand um, the first presentation basically stated that, you know, we don't want to hold off on anything. It's important. The MOU and the VPO is important, um, but that is my concern. You, you never know, um, you know, how the provincial government will take that. I am very pleased um, as much as I can be uh, with regards to Clause 2.17, um, where life cycle costing and deferred maintenance is considered by the province. So there is some movement. Um, I would support the motion going to the board, um, given that it is a new minister, uh, possibly a letter could be written, um, if there's any difference, maybe, but that's, that's a thought to be, um, to be, to be discussed later on down the line. Um, but it's important to get this MOU start signed and, and to have um, funding uh, to keep flowing for seismic projects and, and any major expansion. So um, just going to look at the chat. Um, okay, uh, Amanda, follow up. Yeah, I was just uh, through the chair, just curious, where in the MOU does it state that all of the options cannot be presented beforehand? I understand that we're not allowed to present one and say, hey, this is our favorite choice. But where in the MOU does it say that nothing can be shared about any of it before a preferred option is chosen? Uh, okay, good point. Um, I know that we can't present a preferred option, but is there something... Um Secretary Treasurer or uh, facilities with regard to that, that we can't present options? I think we do already, do we not? For some. David? I think, Matt, I think Mr. Chair, we do, we do present the options. I know that um, when we look at individual projects, I, I believe, and maybe somebody, Ron McDonald or John Dawson can correct me, but uh, the, the school seismic committee uh, is aware of other options that, that are being considered. Is that right, gentlemen? Yes, uh, it may be silent, uh, the, Mr. Chairman, may be silent on the issue of presenting options without a, uh, a, a preferred one being identified. I'm just reviewing the document. Right. Okay. All right. And then, uh, through the charter, the, yeah. you know, the, the three categories are seismic upgrade, partial replacement, or, or full replacement. And I would I would like to you know take that away and and learn more about exactly how far you can go with the details of those options on the, with the MOU in place. Right. Okay. So we'll have some um, we'll get some more information, Deepak. Okay, Amanda. All right, so to the committee members, uh, with regard to the recommendation, um, uh, the revised MOU to be supported and approved. Um, oh, Trustee Hansen. Yeah, I support the recommendation, Chair. Thank you. Trustee Reddy. I support the recommendation to be discussed by the board at the May meeting, yep. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Cho. Yes, I'm in support, thank you. Thank you, and I'm in support as well. So, uh, recommendation from the committee uh, to the board. So, that'll be going to the board. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the extended time frame here. And um, I'll have uh, information item request. Oh, Jim Chester, question. I'll oh, sorry. sorry. Can we get, yes. Could we get an update uh, through the chair? Can we get an update on Carlton? Apparently, there was some activity on the site, and I just wondered what it was. Oh, all right. Um, I don't know if it, uh, like right now or uh, no, no, later. later. What, yeah, okay. Later. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry. What did you see there? Uh, there were there was some work work being done. Oh, all right. Okay. Um, so the next committee meeting, Carlton. Um, Maybe, uh, all right. 
Uh, anyone else? Okay. So thank you, everyone, uh, this evening. And oh, sorry. Alan, I, I have a request. Oh, okay, Amanda. Hi. Um, can we at the next meeting? Can we have an update on the Strathcona action plan for the safe playgrounds that they presented at the last meeting? Yeah. Oh, all right. That sounds good. Yeah, we had the trustees had some stuff as well on that. So good one. Okay. Thank you. All right. Right on time. We have to go to another meeting. I appreciate that from everybody. Next meeting is June fourteenth, five p.m. Have a good evening, everybody. Trustees, move over to the next meeting, please. Thank you.